Hi there, hope you're well. Uh, a couple of years ago, I put out a set of videos called Caminatory Basics about wall cabinet construction. And even today, I still get a lot of yes, but what about base cabinets questions. So in this one, I'll be condensing many of those questions down into an easy to follow tutorial to help you understand why I make them the way I do. Yeah, not like that, more like this. Uh, like that original series though, these videos are also sponsored by Medite. You know Medite, they're a well-established manufacturer of top quality MDF. Every painted bookcase, every wardrobe, every cabinet, every door and every set of shelves you might have seen me make or install on the channel has been made with Medite MDF, mostly MR or moisture resistant MDF because it cuts machines and takes paint particularly well. And in this video, I'll be using what you might call Medite's ultimate MR MDF panel. That's Medite Optima. As we'll see when I make some raised panel doors in the next video, Optima machines particularly well with the denser core reducing labor time in sanding and actually needs less paint for finishing. Medite also backs up their product with plain English technical support that's easy to understand both for us and our customers. And as I say, I'll be using Medite Optima in these videos. There are links in the video descriptions to where you can sign up for additional information and technical advice. And I'd like to thank Medite for their support of the channel and in this video series. So I've built a few cabinets just to show you the different ways you can go about this. And I'll just be putting the last one together now. I just want to be clear that this isn't going to be a prescriptive video. I'm not telling anybody how they should make cabinets. I'm just going to be explaining the pros and cons of each approach as there are a few things to consider. And it'll mostly be a general overview rather than focusing on, say, pocket hole screws versus dominoes, as I covered a lot of that ground in the previous series. And I'd recommend you watch that set of videos if you need that kind of detail. So this is actually the first time I've ever built a cabinet in this style and don't worry if you don't see the difference right now, I'll explain that to you in a sec. One thing I did just want to show uh, or point out is that one of the differences between wall and base cabinets, and that's the top. With the base cabinet you don't generally have one because it doesn't really perform any function. I've added one to this single cabinet to show you what I mean. Now whether the cabinet is freestanding on its own or in a run like they are here, there's almost always a top that overhangs the sides and the front face. With a kitchen cabinet, for example, you'd have the worktop or countertop like this one. And yes, this is a section from my own kitchen. Nice, huh? Now, while it's not especially difficult to fit the sides to a top like this, there are definitely easy ways to do it. And you certainly don't want to be carrying a cabinet around with no top to it, which is where these front and rear stretchers come in. They keep the sides located to make it easier to move around and easier to fix the worktop to as well, because you can just screw it in from underneath. I'll quickly swap this solid top out for the stretchers. Then we'll take a look at the difference between these three cabinets. Okay, so these two are broadly similar. Obviously one's a double, but there's a couple of other differences too. But this one, this is the one that's a different method of construction altogether. And as I mentioned before, it's the first time I've made a cabinet in this style where the sides run all the way down to the floor. It's certainly a strong way to do it. In the previous videos, we talked about the forces acting on a wall hung cabinet as being downward trying to pull the cabinet apart. But here the weight on the base cabinet is also downward but trying to push the carcass into the floor. Now I've just butt jointed the base and the stretches into the sides. Some folks will set those into housings or dados for extra strength. But as makers I think we tend to over engineer things and you'd have to be catering for some very serious loads to make that worthwhile at least from an engineering and mechanical point of view. Notice as well that the carcass sides have a notch cut out for an integrated toe kick. I've rarely seen this style of cabinet outside of YouTube videos made by our American cousins, a point I mentioned on Instagram only to be told by one of my followers that they've installed lots of this style of cabinet whilst shop fitting. So perhaps I've just had a sheltered life. Let me just say that I've never seen this style of cabinet fitted into a domestic situation and leave it at that. So what are the downsides of this style? 
Well, the obvious one is that with the sides bearing directly against the floor, you need to have a pretty flat and level floor to install them onto, otherwise you'll be scribing the sides to an uneven floor, which would be a major time sink. Also with the carcass in direct contact, you run the risk of the actual cabinet being damaged if there's any kind of damp issue or flood particularly relevant in a kitchen or bathroom, for example. So what about alternatives? Well, most commercially made kitchen cabinets here in the UK are made with adjustable feet like these. They're simple to fit, easy to adjust for uneven floors, and are great to use if you have a tall carcass, a wardrobe or a shelf unit that reaches right to the ceiling as you can just wind it up into position. The downside of them is that whilst they're very strong in compression, they're not great for moving a cabinet around as they don't drag well, especially on carpet. You have to lift them up to move them along if you want to avoid snapping the legs. By the way, something that's often missed with these is that the housing or socket that the leg sits into is an uneven shape. This is so that when it's fitted, it bears against the bottom edge of the carcass side, giving additional support so all the weight isn't borne just by the cabinet fixings. And while we're at it, yes, most commercial cabinets have the top stretchers and the base set within the sides for all the same reasons as they are on wall cabinets, strength, aesthetics, and convenience of manufacture. Now, the other option of base cabinets, and the one that I prefer personally, is to build a plinth for the cabinets to sit on. A plinth doesn't have to be anything fancy. This is the same Optima MDF as the carcass, but I've also just used plain softwood in the past and the real benefit of this approach is that when you have a run of cabinets once the plinth is leveled up it's really easy to move the individual carcasses around into position and once in position they can easily be fixed through the base of the carcass into the plinth notice these wider bearers in the plinth where the cabinets butt together perfect for fixing into and i like to use these tongue tight or lost tight screws as they have a tiny head that's easily hidden so that's the basic construction of the top and the base and the sides and how they bear against the floor. What about the cabinet back? As always, there's a few options here and I've made each of these cabinets a little differently just to illustrate them. So in this first cabinet, we've got a solid back that's inset. It fits within the carcass sides and base. And this would normally be secured with hidden fixings like dowels or dominoes and fitted during the actual cabinet carcass construction. A solid back makes for a robust, if heavier cabinet, but it can be a nuisance when it comes to drilling through it for services like water or waste pipes in a kitchen or bathroom. To make those kind of cutouts, often cabinets will have a thinner back that's set into a groove around the sides and base, like I have in this double cabinet, and this can be secured to the top stretcher at the rear. Often there's also an additional rail at the top rear of the cabinet to fix the carcass to the wall, and like the inset back, there's nothing visible at the sides. And finally, we've got a simple thin back that's just planted on. This is effective when the cabinet sides won't be seen, when it's the middle cabinet in a run, for example. And it's really easy to fit as it can be simply pinned, screwed, or just stapled on. If you're making custom cabinets for your own home, then you can make them whatever size you like, but for a kitchen, it's worth bearing in mind that base cabinets here in the UK are typically 720 millimeters high and 550 millimeters deep. Kitchen worktops are typically 610 to 650 mil deep, so the additional space at the back of the carcass makes a services gap where water, waste, and electrics can be run. That void can present a bit of a challenge when it comes to fixing the cabinet to the wall, and one way around it is to use clever little gadgets like space plugs like the kitchen feet then could be adjusted for reach to provide a solid support and then screwed through for a permanent fixing. 
that's this week's introduction to base cabinet basics so be sure to join me in the next one where i'll be making some raised panel doors for these cabinets but i'm going to call this one done for this week thanks so much for taking a look thanks also to medac for the opportunity uh, don't forget to check out the links in the video description down below and i'll see you all again very soon all right take care